Good evening everybody and welcome to episode two of Murder at Bedtime with Linden. We're going to get straight on with it. You know, we get no waffle in this. It's straight on with the murder. So here we go. At 4am on the 23rd of June 2006, a man walked into Luton Police Station and told the front desk officer he had killed two people. One was in his van parked outside and one was in a flat in Ellsbury. The man was Janos Rosavogi, and for a few months in 1994, we worked together. The first thing you noticed about Ros when he first started working with us was his size. He was built like a brick outhouse with hands like shovels. And I don't want to describe him as to embellish the story, but he had what I would call cold eyes and I found him very imposing. But I also would add that to me, he was always quietly spoken and polite, even though a very slow worker, a bit of a plodder. He didn't seem to do any harm to anyone, but for some reason, our maintenance man of the time took an instant dislike to him from day one and would use any opportunity to goad him or try to get him into an argument. And I remember thinking, this is not going to end well and it didn't. One day in the canteen, the maintenance man, and I won't embarrass him by naming him, decided to get physical with Roz over something very trivial, and Roz knocked him out with one punch. We were told later that he was a champion boxer back in his native Hungary, but I tried to research this and I can't confirm it at all. What I can confirm is that the maintenance man sustained quite a lot of damage and had to go home. Now, I spoke with my boss last week as to what happened next, and he said as follows. I went to speak to Roz and I said, I don't really know what to do about this. To which Roz replied, I think you would better sack me. And he left. In reality, the maintenance man is the person who should have been sacked and Roz should have stayed. Would the story be any different if he had? Who knows? So forward 13 years and this same man has committed a terrible, unnecessary crime. The body outside the police station in the transit van was his ex-wife, Patricia Rosavolgi, and the body back in the flat at Wigmore Road, Aylesbury, was her son from a previous marriage, Anthony Parsons. Patricia and Rosavolgi married in 1983, but divorced in 1985 but then, for some reason, continued living together for another 20 years. In 1988, Patricia purchased the flat at Wigmore Road and the mortgage was in her name and she made all the payments. In 1993, Patricia received a redundancy payment of £46,000 and in April 2000, she agreed to pay Rosavolgi £13,000 on the basis that he would make no further financial demands on her. But no, he wanted more. So she gave him a further 15,000 pounds. By 2005, she had paid off the mortgage and wanted Rosavolgi to leave the flat. At this time, she told workmates that he had been violent towards her, was claiming half the property and had made threats to kill her, her son, Anthony and his family. In 2006, Rosa Volgi wanted more money, so she gave him a further £2,000, but now he also wanted half the equity in the house. Patricia reluctantly agreed, but after meeting with a solicitor, she decided not to proceed, and he left the flat in March 2006. Now, Rosa Volgi went to live in Luton at no fixed address, only returning periodically to get his mail, but presumably brooding and getting angry every day about, in his mind, being swindled out of £115,000. In June 2006, he told friends he was going to kill her, as she has stiffed me, and also said revenge is a dish served bloodily. And on the 19th of June 2006, he had been waiting at the flat and told her if she didn't let him come back, he would kill her. On the 22nd of June 2006, Janice 
Rosavogi was as good as his word. Somehow he got Patricia into his van, drove to a secluded spot, had sex with her, then strangled her. Now, do you think Patricia got in his van willingly and had consensual sex with him? That's for you to decide. Because that was pretty well, it was left at that at the trial. So we will never know. But it seems very doubtful. What we do know is that he then drove to the flat at Wigmore Road, let himself into the flat, changed into Patricia's clothes, drowned her three cats and sharpened a knife, and then laid in wait for 40 year old Anthony, a well liked married father of three who was just popping round to see his mum. But for some reason, Rosaboli thought he was in league with his ex-wife to stop him getting the money. When Anthony arrived at the flat, Rosaboli confronted him and stabbed him to death. Anthony had been stabbed 22 times and the tip of the knife had broken off inside his body, so vicious was the attack. After killing Anthony, Rosavolgi changed back into his own clothes, washed and turned on the gas in an attempt to destroy the evidence. Did he have a plan? If so, it doesn't seem very well thought out. So back to 4am at Luton Police Station on the 23rd of June 2006. Rosavolgi told the front desk officer he had killed Patricia and Anthony by suffocation and multiple stab wounds. He said that he had killed them because they had swindled him out of £115,000 and he had been suffering from depression. He had dried blood stains on his hands and clothing and he said in the presence of the examining doctor because he himself had seven minor injuries it was revenge, pure revenge. And on the 24th of June an officer on cell watch heard him say I did not mean to hit him, but I hate the stupid bitch. The defence case at the trial was that he had been guilty of the manslaughter of Patricia. This is where we hear of his so-called plan. He had not wanted to do her any harm, but only wanted to talk to her about the flat. And that she was being used by Anthony for his own greed. With all hope of persuading her to change her mind gone, he decided to render her temporarily unconscious with a bin bag over her face and administer brandy-laced sleeping tablets. While she was unconscious, the plan was to drive Anthony out of the flat where he wrongly believed he was living, recover from Anthony his key, and in believing that possession is nine-tenths of the law, it would now be his flat. So not a great plan. So as for murdering Anthony, he now tells us that this was in self-defence. And in the attack on him by Anthony, he received seven injuries. He said he entered the living room to confront Anthony and to take back his key and then eject him from the property. He had already come with a metal pole and a knife as he feared Anthony would use violence against him. But before there could be any discussion, Anthony took the pole from him and pushed him backwards. In self-defence, Rosavolgi produced the knife from his pocket, got Anthony in a headlock and stabbed him. He added that he had a fear of Anthony and referred to him as demonic. His change of clothes was to stop him becoming contaminated with Anthony's evil. I notice that there is no mention of the three cats he drowned and set outside the kitchen window in this defence or the fact that he left the gas on. The psychiatric experts all agreed that he had a mental illness. At the time of the murder, which was clinical depression, the dispute was the seriousness of the mental illness, whether it was mild or moderate, and also as to the level of his impairment or functioning. The jury thought that he was guilty of double murder, and so did the judge and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison on the 5th of October 2007. His sentence will end on the 5th of October 2032. Rosavolgi will be 79 years old. 
In 2006, a neighbour had said that Rosa Volga used to be the life and soul of the party, but about 10 years ago he became depressed and was a different person. I think maybe the neighbour was maybe mistaken, and it may have been more like over 10 years he was depressed, because in 1994, when I worked with him, he was definitely quiet and withdrawn. Patricia was described as a lovely lady, very friendly and community spirited, and Anthony a very well liked family man who was very popular at work. It was a terrible waste of two lives by a man who seemed to think he was owed something. Was he owed something? Had he paid into that relationship for 20 years? And was he entitled to his half of the equity? The judge thought not, and on the evidence I've seen, Patricia was more than generous with him. One thing that did confuse me was the cause of death. It was strangulation, not suffocation, according to the court. But everything you hear from Rosavoggi is about him putting the bag over the head. He must have strangled her later, but that, that has not, uh, not been mentioned. Anyway, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please leave me your feedback. It's your comments that make me want to do more. So I do have some more, have some more in the offing. So I hope you enjoyed tonight. Sleep well and see you all soon. Thank you for listening.